So hello and welcome to the third and final session of our web series on trademarks versus brands in Asia perspective. Uh, we are covering the jurisdictions of India, China, Malaysia and Singapore. In our first session we gave you a general overview on brand protection and in our second session we covered the brand registration process across these countries in Asia. In today's session we will address the enforcement mechanism for when a brand or a trademark is infringed in any of these countries. Now China has a civil law system which is quite different to India, Malaysia and Singapore. China's legal system is based on codified law whereas India, China, India, Malaysia and Singapore are essentially based on the common law system derived from the UK. In today's session we will cover the difference of the enforcement in these two countries um, specifically with relation to uh, in infringement action infringement suit uh, and the passing of action in the common law jurisdictions. Uh, I hope you enjoy today's session and uh, please share any feedback that you have. Thank you. Uh, I think the immediate step is to call me <laughs> uh, seriously. It's quite important for you to engage a lawyer on the ground straight away. Uh, remember I, what I mentioned uh, in session one, China is not uh, a dual yourself jurisdiction. It's very important to get the right lawyer to, to talk to them straight away. Now, after you engage your lawyer, the next step is to work out with the lawyer what can be done and strategies and priorities. Uh, we usually uh, recommend the client to immediately collect and notarize the infringement evidence. And this can include the website selling the infringing products because if you don't do that, the, um, the infringers can take down the infringing website, so you have no evidence at all. So regardless of whether you're ready or not, it's quite important to do that. It's time consuming and costly, but you can't go to the authorities or the court empty handed without any evidence. So that's the number two you need to do. Uh, usually people will send a cease and desist letter or notice to the infringer, but in China it's optional. It's not a mandatory requirement for taking legal actions against the infringer. But if you want to take actions against the e-commerce platforms or the organizers or, or trade shows or exhibitions, then it's very important that you send a letter, uh, um, cease and desist letter to them. Uh, and the, another two things you need to consider immediately is, are you going to file a complaint at the market uh, supervision uh, authorities in China where the infringement took place? Or do you want to take actions against, uh, a court actions against infringers? Those issues you need to consider. And then back to the issues about uh, collecting the evidence, that's really important. So in my view, as soon as one finds out of a possible infringement, it's imperative to carry out some bad background checks and gather some evidence on where the brand is being used in the public domain, like newspapers, internet, trade forums. By whom is it being used? Manufacturers, traders, retailers, and for what it is being used, that is the goods and services. It would also help to carry out a search to check if the trademark registration applications have been made by the infringer with the trademark office. Now, before one initiates any legal action, it's important to send the infringer a notice to cease and desist from using the infringement, infringing trademark. This letter is also called a letters of claims or a letter before action. What this letter basically aims is to start the communication between the brand owner and the infringer its goal is to open a dialogue so that one can settle without any need for legal action. Ideally, this notice should be drafted by a legal expert. In addition to this, one could also publish a caution notice in two or three prominent newspapers warning the consumers that the, and the public at large of the unauthorized use of your trademark. If the infringer still does not comply with the requirements of the cease and desist notice, you will have no choice but to go for court relief. In Malaysia, uh, I would break it up into three parts. Uh, one is uh, the investigating steps. Uh, what we will do is usually uh, to uh, encourage uh, a brand owner to um, 
launch a investigative step, meaning to collate evidence um, or take pictures of the uh, products, uh, the uh, uh, probably go for a trap purchase, uh, um, and on completion, uh, get a statutory declaration, a written document affirmed before a commission of oath, uh, enclosing uh, documents of the infringed uh, mark, uh, the product, um, and that would be used uh, as evidence in court. Now, the second part is, uh, of course, uh, upon uh, uh, the satisfaction of uh, the investigating uh, investigative step, we will uh, issue a cease and desist letter, uh, basically demanding uh, for the infringer to stop uh, uh, infringing the mark. And then, of course, the third step is to proceed to court. Okay, so that is basic. Uh, three steps uh, that uh, we will advise a brand owner uh, to take uh, when they find out about a uh, infringement of their products or their mark. Okay. Right. So in um, in Singapore, um, maybe I just start with some basis of um, what is the prerequisite for infringement in Singapore, and basically it's that you are using an infringing sign. Um, in the course of trade as the means of distinguishing the origin of the goods or services. So the infringing sign, we need to establish that it is identical or similar to the brand owner's mark and it is used for identical or similar services. Now in Singapore, there is no requirement to prove any actual confusion by the consumer, but you only need to show the likelihood of confusion. Then, um, if you don't have a registered mark and you're trying to rely on the passing off to, um, action, you need to show that the brand owner has established goodwill in Singapore. The alleged infringer by, by using a similar mark is misrepresenting the consumer and the brand owner has suffered damages. Um, I would agree with my colleagues that the first step to do is to go and see your IP lawyer. Uh, because this is not something you can handle um, on a do-it-yourself manner. So the first thing, of course, that the lawyers would want to do is establish whether there are rights. How to establish that? We would look first, when did the infringement take place? Are we within any limitation period? In Singapore, it's six years. Do we have all the evidence in place, as my colleague Shamish has mentioned just now? Do we have a registered mark or is it an, um, a pending mark? What about the, the, the alleged infringer? Do they have better rights than you? Do they have an earlier right than you? So what sort of defenses would the infringing party have? Um, and how strong is your trademark registration? Did you meet the requirements of it um, not being descriptive, being highly distinctive? So once a case um, and the grounds that will be relied on has been established, we can then issue a cease and desist letter. And some of the outcomes would include um, a settlement or commence action or a settlement with collaboration in the form of licensing. I, th I think I'll probably start with the work which you really need to do before uh, you can start a formal uh, court process. The first thing is you've got to prepare, do a lot of preparation before uh, you can file or prepare your application. And that includes to identify the infringers. Who are they? Are they manufacturers? Or they are distributors or service providers? And once you decide uh, on this question, that also will affect where the um, which court you can take action against the infringer. And the next one is everybody talk about that already. And what evidence do you have? What more do you need to collect before you can certify the court that you've got enough evidence of infringement? And um, and and the third one is you need to work out the claim. How much are you going to claim? And uh, how much you claim has also will affect your, uh, your consideration of which court you're going to choose. 
uh, when you claim damages, you sort of need to decide what's the damages you uh, uh, you have suffered, and also what's the basis for claim, uh, claiming or cal calculating the damages. Um, you can also rely on the statutory uh, um, compensation allowed by either the trademark uh, law or the unfair uh, competition law. Um, for trademark infringement, the uh, the maximum statutory compensation is five million RMB. And on what ground you can claim, uh, you can file your claim? Uh, well, you already said the two uh, claims, uh, two grounds people tend to use when they file a claim. One is the trademark infringement, another is a fair competition. You can include both grounds in your application, but usually the court will ask you to remove one uh, if uh, the court believes that the one ground is more uh, appropriate for your case. And then as part of that, you also need to consider, are you going to take any, uh, seek any interim injunctions? That including injunctions against the uh, infringers and also whether you can ask for preservation of the evidence or preservation of the assets. And those things are really important. When you decide that, when you seek uh, uh, injunctions, the injunction should be sought as the same court where you're going to take actions against the infringer. Um, now we talk about which court. It is uh, actually a very complicated issue. There's probably two issues, to, two questions you need to ask. Whereabouts and which level of the court you need to start your uh, litigation. Um, you only need to decide where first. The rule for dis, uh, deciding uh, the courts with jurisdiction is really very complicated. And for those issues, you really have to work with your lawyers and decide which is the appropriate court. If you get it wrong, then that uh, downside can be quite serious. Uh, when you decide uh, which court is the appropriate court, uh, those factors you need to consider include whether there's a foreign party, that's a you know, a uh, company from Singapore, or whatever countries, or India, and how much you're going to ask for compensation, and also where the infringement took place, when, and where's the domicile of the defendants. All these issues will affect the final decision of which court you're going to go. Now we talk about those preparation work. It's the time now to prepare for the uh, formal documents uh, and file it at the court with jurisdiction. Uh, this will be done by your lawyers with your instruction, of course. As part of that, you need to um, get a power attorney, give the power attorney to your lawyers. And this power attorney and other required court documents must be legalized, which means notarized and certified in your country. as time consuming and must be done properly. Otherwise, it can affect your application, the validity of your application. And for evidence, if they are, um, all the evidence will have to be done translated into Chinese if the uh, evidence are uh, produced in another language. And evidence from offshore must also be legalized. Okay, once we've done that, you're ready to file. Uh, for court, we have a two tier system the first instance plus appeal. And uh, um, I think uh, Mohit mentioned before, China is civil country. And so the process is quite different from places of the common countries which three of you belong. So we need to be very uh, careful about the differences. Uh, for civil cases, the trial court uh, usually should finish its in, uh, review within six months. For appeal, it should be three months. But unfortunately, this timeline doesn't apply to uh, foreigners. So in our experience, Usually when you have foreign party involved, it takes about uh, a year or longer to complete one process. And after you file the application at the court, and uh, um, the court will notify the defendants and after parties to exchange and uh, examine the evidence before hearing, then the next thing is the court hearing. Uh, for most of the cases, it will be just one hearing, but if the case is very difficult or complicated, the court has the right to or discretion to organize another hearing. And before or after or during, the, during or after court hearing, the court can check with the two parties to see whether they have any uh, uh, intention to settle. If they can be set, if they if they have the intention to settle, the court will precise over the settlements. If not, the court will just go ahead to issue the judgments. Um, either party can uh, appeal in China within three days after you got the uh, first instance court judgments, and then the, uh, and the uh, decision of the appellate court is final. 
uh, there's this, another thing I need to mention is there's a retrial process, but it's very hard to, 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 to use because you need to get special approval to uh, be able to uh, rely on this uh, retrial process. Um, basically, it's because the decision is wrong or there's other procedural things, then you can prove it to the, uh, the other court, the higher court, then it's very hard to get one. A valid trademark registration gives you a right to take infringement action under trademark law in addition to the right of passing off under common law. Indian law recognizes two types of trademark infringements. Direct infringement, which is a result of direct breach of the trademark law. And second is an indirect infringement that is in the form of vicarious liability and contributory infringement. In India, the infringement of a trademark is a cognizable offense which means that the infringer may also face criminal charges along with civil charges. It is not required by Indian law for the trademark to be registered for the institution of civil or criminal proceedings. As mentioned before, this is due to the common law principle of passing off. A civil action can be initiated by filing a lawsuit before the district court or a high court having territorial jurisdiction. In such cases, a court may award the following remedies a temporary injunction, a permanent injunction, damages, account of profits, that is damages in the, in the amount of profits gained from the infringement, destruction of goods using infringing mark, and cost of legal proceedings. In case of criminal proceedings, the court may order punishments in the form of imprisonment for a period not less than six months, which may extend to three years and a fine which is not less than rupees 50,000 which may extend to rupees 2 lakhs. Now, uh, the court process, uh, uh, first and foremost, we have to identify uh, where did the uh, alleged infringement take place. In Malaysia, we have 14 states. Um, if it is, for instance, uh, the infringement has taken place in Kuala Lumpur, then uh, your lawyer will have to file a suit in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, in KL, we have uh, a dedicated IP court. Um, uh, the other states, we do not have a dedicated IP court. However, uh, it is jurisdictional based in the sense of where the infringement took place as far as the state is concerned. Now, uh, upon which uh, the uh, client uh, can have an option to file an injunction, of course, to restrain the infringer from uh, pursuing with uh, the uh, act of infringement. Um, you will have to satisfy a few elements as far as an injunction is concerned. Uh, there's balance of convenience, you need to show these issues to be tried. And of course, it cannot be compensated by damages. Now, uh, a civil suit uh, will be focused on uh, accounts of profit uh, you also will uh, can claim for the damages uh, which will ultimately need to be uh, proven by the plaintiff. Um, uh, in Malaysia, uh, most courts will encourage parties to try uh, to mediate the matter. Uh, it is a, a widely practiced process before the matter goes for trial. Uh, parties will, uh, with their lawyers, uh, engage in a mediation process uh, I would think about 60 odd percent of the cases are successfully mediated. 40 odd percent will pursue for trial. Uh, appeal process, uh, the uh, unsuccessful party uh, at the High Court, the Court of First Instance, has 30 days to file an appeal to the Court of Appeal. Um, usually, uh, it would end there, but uh, in a very, um, there are few cases will go to the uh, highest court in the land, which is a federal court. Uh, that you need to pass uh, two stages, which is a leave application and the appeal proper. Uh, so that uh, would be the court process uh, in Malaysia. Right, so once the brand owner is satisfied that they have a reasonable good case, evidence is all sufficient, action can commence. Um, in Singapore, there is no need for a cease and desist letter. However, this is usually the starting point. 
um, what are the courts in Singapore? So the method of um, enforcement um, or, or action could be by way of a civil action in the High Court of Singapore for trademark infringement. So all trademark infringement matters will commence in the High Court. It doesn't matter what is the amount of damages. However, if it is a matter of uh, passing off, an action of passing off, then it could be either in the State Court or the High Court. So if the damages claimed for passing off is anything below 250,000, it will commence in the state court. Another alternative that Singapore has is mediation or arbitration. Um, WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Centre, that's the World Intellectual Property Organization's um, Arbitration and Mediation Centre, has an office in Singapore. And it offers parties a privately, a private and efficient matter of, manner of settlement of the matter. And otherwise, you could go for um, arbitration with the Singapore International Arbitration Centre and um, the commencement of action will be with a specialist, a specialised IP panel for arbitrators to hear the IP disputes. Of course, um, the difference between going to court and arbitration would be that in court, you actually have, um, you're able to claim the injunction relief. So with regards to civil actions, it's commenced by way of a writ of summons. We would serve a copy of the writ on the alleged infringer and he would have eight days to enter appearance, either in person or to his lawyer. He would then have 22 days for the date of appearance to file a defence. If he either fails to file the memorandum of appearance or a defence, we are then entitled to enter default judgment. If the inf alleged infringer does file a defence, we would usually try to dispose the case by way of a summary judgment. That is to say, we would argue that the infringer has no defence to the action. This would entail filing a summons with an affidavit by the IP owner, the brand owner. So the remedies available, similar to India and Malaysia, would be an injunction, costs um, for the legal expenses and damages, or an account for profits. So it's in the alternative, you can't have both damages and the account for profits. Breach of the injunction would be tantamount to contempt of court for which committal proceedings may be brought against the infringer. The costs ordered would usually be half to two thirds of the IP owner's legal costs and the damages would have to be assessed at a separate hearing and would be quantified in terms of the IP owner's loss or the infringer's profit. Okay, um, there are a few options uh, for your market supervision authority, and that can be uh, fairly quite effective and uh, faster than court actions. Uh, but there's no position to you, so you need to consider uh, whether it's a good idea or not. But the um, authority can conduct a raid on the infringer's properties and confiscate uh, the infringing products. And the authority can also impose a fine on the infringers um, and seize and destroy the products. Um, the authority can also um, uh, revoke the business license of the infringer. That means the, the infringer can't carry on business without the business license. Um, you can also use the evidence you collected at this stage as uh, used for future court action. Now you can also take civil actions in both trademark infringement and unfair uh, comp competition, like I said before. Uh, before or during that process, you can ask for uh, interim injunctions uh, from the courts. We don't have John Doe orders in China because in China, the injunction uh, should be against a particular person. Uh, the last one you can do is, uh, well, last option is to uh, take uh, criminal actions you need to file the application to the uh, public security departments, uh, requesting them to start a criminal investigation. If the uh, public security department believes that the case can be justified, it will accept your application, conduct the investigation, and transfer the case to the prosecutors for prosecution. In a criminal case, if the prosecutor uh, allows, it is possible to combine the civil action with the uh, criminal action and the court can review the two cases together. For criminal offence, um, it can be up to three years imprisonment with or without penalty 
or if it's really serious, uh, the um, uh, imprisonment can be uh, three to up to seven years imprisonment plus penalty. In India, there are various laws under which counterfeiting can be curbed. Criminal remedies are provided under the Trademark Act, Copyright Act, Geographical Indications Act, and the Information Technology Act, amongst others. Offenses under these laws are punishable by six months to three years, and imprisonment uh, of imprisonment and fine up to rupees five thousand to two lakh rupees. The Code of Criminal Procedure governs the procedure applicable to these criminal cases. And assets of entities falsely using another party's intellectual property may be seized by the authorities along with arrest. Under these laws, offenses are cognizable in nature, which means that the police can take action and conduct search and seizure without a court warrant. Charges may also be brought against an officer of a company who is responsible for its management if he or she has knowledge of a commission of the offense. In case of offences under the Trademark Act, the police usually seek the opinion of the register, registrar of trademarks before initiating any action. All of the intellectual property statutes provide for civil, civil remedies as well in the form of injunctions and damages. Indian courts are inclined to grant ex parte injunctions at the admission of a lawsuit, especially where counterfeiting is involved. A few interim remedies that right holders can obtain in civil actions for counterfeiting include Anton Pillar orders. The right holders in this case may seek ex parte appointment of court commissioners to visit the defendant's premises in order to find and seize counterfeit goods. The goods are returned to the defendant with an undertaking that the goods will be safely preserved until further orders of the court. Another option is John Doe orders. This is an extraordinary order through which the court can appoint court commissioners and authorize them to enter, search and see, execute seizures in the premises of any named or unnamed defendants. This kind of action is most effective where it, where it is difficult to identify each and every counterfeiter or where the counterfeiter is operating out of a temporary premises. Lastly, there is an option for Meriva injunctions. In specific cases, an injunction may be granted against infringers to freeze their assets until further court orders. Counterfeiting is increasingly gaining the attention of the government agencies as it sees a serious threat of national importance and the Indian government recently took a major positive step in this regard by formulating a national IP rights policy and establishing a dedicated cell for IP rights promotion and management. Counterfeit is uh, taken seriously in Malaysia. Um, as far as a, a criminal action is, uh, is concerned, um, you can make a complaint to the Trade Ministry. Uh, that is the ministry uh, in charge of uh, uh, counterfeiting, uh, upon which the Trade Ministry will launch an investigative uh, process. Uh, sometimes will take some time. Now, um, we will advise a client usually to uh, go to court and obtain a trade description order from the High Court. Uh, trade description order uh, is a conclusive proof uh, that the infringing mark uh, bears a false trade description. Now, once uh, an order is obtained, uh, we will produce that order, uh, supply that order to the uh, Trade Ministry, uh, and they are compelled uh, to rate the premises and uh, uh, nab the, uh, the wrongdoer and charge them in court. Okay, so uh, the, the infringer will be subjected to a criminal proceedings, uh, wherein, of course, uh, he will be uh, given the opportunity to defend himself. Um, and, but uh, if he loses, he'll be subjected to a fine and so forth. Yeah? So um, apart from that, um, the uh, Brand owner can also institute an injunction uh, in court, uh, either get an Anton Pillar order, similarly as what uh, Neha has uh, spoken in India, uh, Mareva injunction is also uh, is recognized uh, in Malaysia. Okay. 
In Singapore, counterfeiting carries both civil and criminal liability. Counterfeits may infringe both registered trademark rights by unauthorized use of the trademark and copyright by reproducing artistic works on packaging. So the typical procedure for enforcement is as follows. The first step would be the pre-action. We need to ascertain the identity of the infringer and source of the counterfeit goods. So for this, we would work closely with private investigators. Once we have discovered the source and the identity, we will need to make a magistrate's complaint to the state courts of Singapore to perform a raid to seize these goods and preserve the evidence. The seized goods will then be stored with the police or at a warehouse. Within two days of the raid, we will have to report back to the magistrate with our findings and also to provide the infringer an opportunity to complain if the raid was improperly carried out. This usually does not occur due to the presence of the accompanying police officers during the raid. At this point, we would have, to, we would have the IP owner examine the seized goods and provide a report as to why they are counterfeit. The various differences from the original goods would have to be listed. We would then see, send a cease and desist letter to the infringer to demand certain remedies such as damages, costs, and undertaking not to infringe in the future and disclosure of their source. Most cases end in settlement at this stage. However, should the infringer be unwilling to cooperate, we would then proceed with criminal and or civil action. So to commence criminal action, we would have to seek the Attorney General's consent to a private prosecution. This is done by way of a letter and information of the raid carried out together with the authentication report and draft charges to be filed against the infringer. With the AG's authorization, we would then return to the Magistrate's Court to file a further complaint and a court date would be set. The charges would then be served on the infringer and he would either plead guilty or not plead guilty or not guilty at the hearing. A not guilty plea would mean that we proceed on to the criminal trial. If found guilty of counterfeiting, the infringer would be liable to a fine of up to $10,000 per item or up to a maximum aggregate of $100,000 or a jail term of up to five years. Now, the usual fine is $500 per item. Um, the other action would be the civil action. As I have discussed earlier, the, the process is the same.